Oh, we welcome. Live. We are live. Welcome to the iSpring Leadership Series. We have another great episode today. We have a great guest with us, Connie Mal Malamed. Um, some of you know her better as Malamed. Yeah. Malamed. Some of you know her better as the e-learning coach and the new author, the author of a new book called Visual Design Solutions. Just came out in April. Oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> the text is not backwards. <laughs> no, it's not backwards. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome, Connie. Tell us, um, I guess, inter tell us about you and what you do besides write great books. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, I've been in the field for over 20 years, and the past about 12 years I've worked as a consultant and a, a as, as an independent consultant and contractor, either building courses or helping people um, usually non often nonprofits and academic institutions with um, strategies for designing learning experiences. Oh, very good. And then did, how long have you had your own business? For about 12 years. 12 oh, years. So, um, I work on website. I do website design also. So that kind of keeps me in the world of user experience and interactive design, too, which applies so much to our field. Yeah, it does. That's interesting. I didn't realize that you did web design as well. You're right. That's um, it's all about the visual today in everything. I, you know, and whether you're talking about learning, whether you're talking about business, marketing, it seems like visuals are critical to capture the attention that is so dwindling from our society. Right. There's been a real cultural shift over the past few decades, going from text to visuals, and um, I think everyone would pretty much say agree that that's that that shift has been happening and it continues to increase. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we found out about your business and how you got into the area of study, but um, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see people making when they have this visual content? Well, I understand why people are making mistakes. I've been through an instructional design program myself, and I have a long list of them on the eLearning Coach site, and I've rarely, not that I've checked out most of them, but I've actually never heard of an instructional design program, and there might be one now, that actually teaches visual design. So it makes sense that people wouldn't be, you know, particularly knowledgeable about it because um, They've never been taught it, and only 50, about 50% 50 of the people in our field have degrees anyway. So it's kind of this mysterious um, body of knowledge that people just haven't been introduced to. And that was why I wanted to write the book, because most of the visual design books out there, and I have, you know, just tons of them. Um, those are just my visual design books in that show. Um, they're, they're wonderful, they're great, but none of them. Um, are focused on visual design plus learning, you know, in that in a learning context, plus e-learning and slides. Now there is a, there are one or two that talk about um, the cognitive you know, nature of and what's best for learning, but not in terms of visual design. Most visual design books talk about logos, identity, branding, um, advertisements. That's what they focus on, and that's relevant up to a point, and then. You have to put it in a learning context, or um, uh, it's just not going to work for us. So some of the biggest mistakes that I see are people making their screens too cluttered, um, people not knowing how to choose a palette, um, not understanding how to direct the learner's eyes, and having a, a center of focus. Those are some of the three big areas that I see where there are problems. That's really interesting. Even as you're saying that, Green, yeah, I don't think they would ever. I, I've never heard that that was being taught in any L and D program. You know, most of it, you would go into marketing and visual and visual graphic design to learn those things. Yeah, uh, we have to change that. Yeah, that that really. I mean, when you think of how important visuals are today, and in our, I, I just think in our cluttered world of so much information coming at us, we need. We need shiny pictures. I always say we need to go back to picture books. Well, you know, there's another fascinating aspect of it, and that is aesthetics. Aesthetics um, are, people are beginning to realize that aesthetics are so important to someone's immediate emotional response, 
and to someone's motivation. So I'm sure you've had the experience of you buy an uh, you buy a mobile phone partly because you have an immediate experience of, of whether it's designed nicely. And the same with websites. If you see a website that's all junky looking, you tend not to trust it and you tend to not want to go back there. But if it's really beautifully designed and you're having a good user experience and you need to go back, you want to go back. Well, it's the same with learning materials. If people see their instructional materials as looking kind of amateurish or junky or difficult to discern what's on the screen, they just don't have a good experience and it actually has a negative impact on learning. There's research, you know, research is kind of just beginning to looking at aesthetics and learning. I'm just finding it so fascinating. I bet. I was going to say, and I want to let our audience know, for those of you um, tuning in live, you can type questions in for Connie. In our, our Q&A is open, so you'll notice an area where you can type your questions. We'll see the questions here, and we'll bring those out to Connie. So um, definitely um, let us know. But Connie, what do you think are three things that if, if someone's not trained in this area, what are three things that people could implement right away? To um, make well, a big impact? What was that? What's the last thing? Like to make a big impact. Okay. Well, I think one of the biggest things someone can do in terms of a cluttered screen is to use subtractive design. And that is, once you have your screen designed, start looking at it and thinking about what do I really need here to get the instructional message across. And start deleting all the things, all the objects, the elements that are not needed until up to the point where the design would break, where you would no longer communicate your message, because that's all it's about is communicating your message. And by doing that, you allow for more white space, which is just empty space or negative space. It doesn't have to be white. You allow for white space in the screen, and that makes it easier for people to process cognitively if there's not too much junk on the screen. So I, I would say the first lesson is to try using subtractive design on your um, slides or screens and see, see if that improves them. Interesting. Before you go to the second one, yes. um, I'm, I see a couple people saying turn down audio echo. I'm, and I want to throw this out to the audience. Are you hearing echo on both, um, on both of our ends? Or is it just on our end that you're hearing echo when we speak? Or is it just on Connie's end? Because we can plug in a headset um, and see if that Sometimes that will do it. Um, are you getting any feedback? Uh, what are they saying? Yeah, let me see it. No one has written their answer yet. Let's see if someone could help us out. Let us know. Where are you hearing the echo so we can fix that? On our end, I'm not hearing it, which is always weird. I'm turning down my volume. Is, just, so let us know. Has that fixed it? Anyone um, viewing in our viewing audience, thank you so much for letting us know we're always it's always interesting because you don't you don't hear the problem and yet I could hear it just a little bit or you could hear the echo so you were hearing us you turn down your volume too and we'll see how it goes yeah let's see if that helps um, oh it looks like okay it says I hear no echo on either end it's, it's okay now okay perfect thank you so much great Vilfred and Yvette, thank you for letting us know. Awesome. Okay, so first thing, um, using so that negative space. Using design. more, yeah, selective design is what we can do. So remove stuff after we, right. after we fill up the space. It's actually subtractive design. You're subtracting things from the design. Okay, and then what other? What two other things can we do? Uh, another really big one that I don't think a lot of learning experience designers know about is establishing a visual hierarchy. So that means that you control what the learner looks at first, second, and third, or first and second if you just have a few things on your screen. And the way to establish a visual hierarchy is to first stop and think what is most important on the screen. Is it a graphic? Is it an interaction? Is it the text? Is it a video? What is most important on the screen? And once you've determined what you want people to look at first, then put that either at the top of the screen, that's one way to make people notice it first, or put it on the towards the upper left, make it larger, or make it brighter. Those are three ways to make people notice something first. 
So you establish a visual hierarchy, then you decide what you want people to see second, and if there's a third element, third. And I have a chapter on establishing a visual hierarchy in my book because it's, it's very, very important, and all designers use that, con use that principle. That's great. That, that's important. You're right. I don't think what, I mean, I've never even really thought about that. Of What do you want people to look I I mean, I always look at what do I want the focal point to be? Where do I want their eyes to go? And making that stand out. But I've never really thought of first, second, third, making something brighter. Um, you're right. You can change just the color, maybe even surrounding it or behind it, and it can. Right. Well, you're right. It is the same thing. It's what do you want your focal point to be? Right. Every screen or slide should have one focal point because then people know where to look because they waste cognitive efforts looking all around the screen, not sure what they're supposed to do. It's just it's kind of like a cognitive cognitive load issue. Which is interesting because I always see that in a presentation. I'm always saying when I look at slides, which most of them are horrific, um, that people put up there with tons of text, and I always say, where do you want their eyes to go? And usually you see the audience, they're scanning. Like they're not even sure. Where, where right. am I supposed to be looking and where are you? And you know, So that is really important is bringing that focal point front and center. So right. yeah, it's wasted mental effort otherwise. And yeah. um, another interesting way, uh, people are, humans are really attracted to other faces. So that's one other way to establish a hierarchy is by showing a face. And, and what you can do is we look at, we look in the direction, this is a little bit of an advanced topic, but we look in the direction of eye gaze. Um, for example, if you see a crowd of people looking up in the sky, you too will look up in the sky. So you can have the person's eye gaze looking at the item that you want them to look at, and it's almost like an arrow. Oh, that's interesting. It is really interesting. That is really interesting. Yeah, if you want them that's to see that text, put someone looking up at that text. So that's another way. And of course, arrows work too. Um, and then a third, I have to pick what, what I think would be a good third one. Um, it could be making the design unified through consistency and repetition. So you choose a good palette, and um, sometimes if I'm fooling around with the palette, I will go to Adobe K-U-H-L-E-R, Adobe Color. I don't know how they pronounce it, Adobe Cooler. K-U-H-L-E-R.com, AdobeColor.com, spelled in an odd way. And you can start playing around with palettes there. And sometimes that's nice if you're real, you know, you can say I want a complementary palette. There are specific rules. And I have a whole chapter of um, about color in my book, but you could just go there and pick out some colors with a custom palette, or use one of the palette rules. Um, so that's one aspect of consistency. Another is repetition, such as um, making sure that all your headlines and titles are using the same font, mm -hmm. and um, repeating shapes. If you have um, like say uh, a, a rectangle, then they continue to use rectangles throughout. Then the only downside of repetition and consistency, well, well let me just say the positive side. The positive side of repetition and consistency is that, um, again, people don't have to try to decipher things. They know what's going on. They know how to, you know, what to look at. It, it, it causes, you know, it, it makes things more clear and causes less confusion. On the other hand, if every screen looked exactly the same, it would become boring. So then don't hesitate when something is instructionally important or if you're just trying to blow people's minds and do something really novel to wake them up again, you know, get them paying attention, you can do something really different. So you want to sprinkle a little variety in there with your consistency and repetition. But since we're in the world of learning, do it for a learning purpose. Right. Combine That's the two. point. That even visuals should have a point and have a purpose for being in there. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I love the, the aspect of color. Sorry, I just interrupted you. <laughs> Go ahead. I didn't say But so we're talking about your new book, and what are some of the main lessons that people can learn in your new book? I just gave them all away. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what really, one thing that I think is so important is that uh, people, you know, and I start out with these kind of big ideas at the beginning, that's what the first section is called, is that 
you don't need to be an artist or to draw well to be more effective at visual design. The two things are different crafts. <clears throat> if you were trying to become a master painter, some of the principles are the same, like white space and your color palette, but anyone, any learning experience designer, instructional designer, can become better at visual design. You just have to know the principles, you apply the principles, and of course you practice. It's a lifelong journey just like writing. You continue to get better at writing, you continue to get better at visual design. So one way is to learn the principles, and I happen to know of a book that teaches them, and the other thing is to become aware of design all around you. When you're standing in line at the supermarket, notice how magazine covers are designed. And am I still with you there? Because your screen has frozen. Ah. Can, I, can you hear me? Now I can. It, it cut, it froze for a second. Yes. <laughs> We're back. Good. So what I said was, look, notice design in the world around you and that will make you better. See things in magazine covers, um, on the metro, you know, if you're riding a subway. You can see the advertisements, billboards, wherever you are. Notice how professionals are designing and find things that you like. Oops, we froze again. Gotta love Google Hangouts. We're back. Okay, I'm not sure what happened, but it's, it's almost like having a brain freeze. Yeah, <laughs> and that. That happens quite a bit. But I, I like what you were saying is notice things around you and start looking at what I always say, what catches your attention? What is it that stops your eyes? You know, right now I look at how much screen time we, we're always looking at our screens for something. And so the clutter, what makes you stop and pay attention? And then take notice of that if you're designing courses is look at how do I implement something like that? Not that it has to be Exactly. Okay, see, I was like, okay, maybe there's short little coffee breaks. Um, oh, Connie isn't freezing, so it's just us, it looks like. So that's good. Keep you talking. Yeah. Um, I'm just sitting here smiling while you're doing it. It's kind of humorous. <laughs> if we freeze, keep talking, Connie. Uh, okay. Thanks, Yvette. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, okay, is there a storm again? We had a big storm in Chicago yesterday. Um, but you know, looking at those designs and implementing those. Well, I want to know, um, let the audience know how they can get a hold of you. Um, do you work with? So, if an organization wants your consulting to come in and help them um, do this, is can they do that? Tell us about how. Well, um, on my site, the elearningcoach.com, I have a contact form, and it comes as an email directly to me. So you can contact me through. Uh, that contact they, form or on Twitter um, at eLearningCoach. So any of those ways are, are work great. Great. And also, I'm giving a workshop at um, DevLearn in Visual Design, and I'm giving a full day workshop at um, ATD's Technology. Oh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So make sure everyone sign up for her course. That's really good. Um, and then show us your book one more time, because where can we grab this book? Um, uh, you can get it on Amazon, and if you're a member of ATD, you can get it there. They were the co-publisher with Wiley, and um, they give you a discount if you're a member. So. Awesome. Well, Connie, this has been great. We're going to look at visuals differently and hopefully create visuals differently. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe to our channel here. There's lots of great hangouts. Um, you can take a look at the past hangouts and there's always more to come, one every month. So thank you for tuning in and connecting with us. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.